thanks for being here. So great to have uh, Taylor and Karen leading worship for us this morning here at this campus. They're our uh, lead worship folks in Beckley, but we love having them here too, don't we? <clears throat> it's great having them. Not only are they here, but a little bitty boy about this big is with them, and he lives with them now. He moved in for a few years, uh, maybe 20 or 25 or 30 years. And he's a good-looking little boy. His name is Ridge. So I call him Blue Ridge, depending on what he's wearing. And it's a beautiful day outside, and we're in the third week of this series called Origin Stories. I hope you uh, like history. I love history, and some of you do. And if you don't, I hope you're getting something from this anyway. Educational, and it's inspirational. And I hope that, uh, that you're learning something that will help you in your life, in your faith, you know, draw you closer to Jesus. And these stories are so inspirational, these origin stories. They just inspire us to step up and toe the line in a culture that's continually pressing against us and, and ridiculing us and wanting to marginalize us as Christ followers. I hope we'll toe the line and at least uh, look a little bit like some of the folks that we've talked about already. And I want to jump right into it today. We're going to kind of cover the third century. We're in the third century, and we're going to talk about a couple leaders, but they're going to come out of some conditions that we talk about. So these are, uh, these are major challenges of early church history. I want, to, I want to remind you of, if you've been here, you, you know some of these, you remember some of these. If you haven't been here, this is a little bit of a new thing for you, then, um, then that's good too. But I just want to remind you of a couple of things that's going on. Now, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're kind of picking up where the Bible leaves off. We're, we're seeing how people who lived outside of the New Testament, past the New Testament, how they practiced their faith, how they lived, how they claimed their following Jesus out there in the, in the public. How did they do that? Now, so there's a, there's a few challenges we need to remind ourselves of. First of all, this is a baby church. It's a baby church. It's brand new. By the third century, it's a couple hundred years old, if that. You know, the beginning of the third, it wasn't quite that. And that, that might sound old to us. So maybe we could, we could say it's a toddler church. But it's young. It's a young church. And being a young church, it had just left the nest of its Jewish parents... It just gone out and left the nest of its Jewish parents. They're starting to reach into the known world, but it's still a baby church because there was a couple other challenges it's facing. First of all, they didn't have a New Testament like you and I have today. That word canon is a word that comes from a, 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 a Greek word which means read. Or in, and it, a read was like a ruler. You know, a 12-inch ruler or a yardstick. It was used to measure things. So they would cut a reed off, and, and that would be their measurement, and that's how they would measure things. So this word came to be used as a word that meant standard. This is our standard. This is the standard measurement. So the word canon became to be identified with a group of writings or a body of written work by which we would measure everything else that people said. So if you said something, and it didn't agree with this measurement, this standard, then we don't believe it, or we're suspicious of it. And so the New Testament canon did not come about, in other words, it wasn't available in one location until, you know, up in the 4th century, even into the 5th century. Now this is the 3rd century we're talking about, and no one place had all the books of the Bible, or, or the, all the books of the New Testament either. Now, these books had been written, and they were being passed around from church to church, and as those churches received them, they would spend maybe a week or a month or a year with them, and they would copy them, so they'd have extra copies, and then they'd send that letter on. The Apostle Paul, in one place, said to the Corinthians, he said, hey, you folks, read the letter, and then you take that letter to Laodicea, and you get the letter I wrote to Laodicea, and you read it. Now, we don't have a letter to Laodicea in our Bible. But the, evidently, Paul wrote a letter to Laodicea, and it was being passed around. Maybe it got burned up in, the, in some of the fires, uh, or it got destroyed in some way. But this was, a, this was a church that did not have the access to the Bible like we have today. And it would definitely make a difference if we didn't have access to the Bible today. We would really have to trust our leaders. 
We would really have to trust that they knew what they were talking about, that they knew the heart of God, that they knew what Jesus did, what he, le- uh, uh, what he said and how he led. And the people around him, the apostles or his brothers like James and Jude, that, that, they, that they, were, they were aware of what these guys had said and what they taught so that they could pass it on to the church. So there was no, no Bible. That didn't come about, uh, you know, the, a collected Bible. Now, these books had been written, but they had, they had not been collected. All right? So that's the New Testament canon. The, the third century church didn't have it. And then thirdly, as we've talked about every week in this time period, the first two, three hundred years of Christianity, there was intense persecution. First by the Jewish leaders. They're the ones that crucified Jesus. They're the ones that killed Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And they're the ones that really persecuted early believers initially. And then this crazy man by the name of Nero. How many of you have heard the name Nero? It's a great name for a dog or a cat or something. Uh, it was the name of this guy's, uh, this guy, this leader, this Roman emperor. And he, he was a little bit crazy, history tells us. A good leader in some respects, but a little bit crazy. And he had this section of Rome that he wanted to clean up. It was called the, the slums of Rome. And he wanted to clean it up. There was disease there. There was, uh, you know, low, uh, the, the people were living on the street, much like, uh, you know, maybe some cities in, uh, in America today. He wanted to get rid of it. So some people believe he had the fire started, and then he blamed it on the Christians because they were easy targets. The Jewish people were persecuting them. Why don't we? And so he began blaming the fire of Rome on the Christians, and an intense persecution broke out in the area of Rome. See, uh, uh, the Caesar there, Nero, who's known as the Caesar, that's the leader of the Roman Empire, uh, Nero is known to have killed Christians in horrific ways. In one way, he would Im- impale them, uh, dip them in some kind of flammable liquid, impale them, and set them in the ground and light them on fire, and they would light up his gardens as people walked by. Terrible way to die. <clears throat> this is what history tells us about him. And so this persecution of Christians became a thing became a thing. First it was local, and then it became, in the third century, it became empire-wide. Everybody, everywhere, who wore the name Christian was liable to be persecuted, tortured, captured, imprisoned, tortured. All sorts of things happened to, and, and ultimately killed. Many of them were killed, and they were known as martyrs. Now, the Christians did not worship the Roman gods. The Romans would have been okay with Christians having their own god as long as they also worshiped their gods. And by this time, the emperor had become a god. There was what's called uh, idol worship or emperor worship. And so these Christians were asked to say a phrase. And this phrase was, Curius Kaiser. Curius Kaiser. And that's two Greek words, which means Lord, Curios, and the next word is the word for Caesar. You might remember even in, even in Germany, uh, the Kaiser. The Kaiser, it was Adolf Hitler. So, Lord, Caesar, and this was translated, Caesar is Lord. If you'll just say this, if you'll just say this and throw some incense toward the, that fire right there on that altar, or if you'll just bow and say, Kurios uh, Kaiser, you can save your life. You can live. But Christians wouldn't do that, because to do that would be to go against everything they believed. It would, be, it would be renouncing or recanting their faith. They didn't say, Kurios, Kaiser. They said, Kurios, Jesus. No, 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 not Kurios, Kaiser. Kurios, Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Because they knew there was a day coming when they would stand in front of God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we will give an account of what we say and what we do while here on earth. They knew this day was coming. And they knew it was as real as this day. Standing before the, the Romans, they would go to their death and then stand in front of God. And they didn't want to stand in front of God, having been embarrassed by recanting or renouncing his name. Jesus said in one place, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you don't confess me before men, I won't confess you before my Father. And they took this very seriously. The verse we read this morning in our focus time that Karen led us in is a great Christian hymn. 
They worked this into their songs. It was part of the first Christian song that we have uh, in history. And this is the end of it. Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that what? Jesus Christ is what? Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And listen to these other verses that would have been resounding in their churches, in their gatherings, in their minds. In Romans 10, Paul had said, if you declare with your mouth, what? And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul was explaining this. He said, look, you're going to stand in front of people who are going to, who are going to judge you. They're going, to, they're going to kill you. They're going to ask you to say certain things. And he said, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. Or kurios kaiser, he could have said there. And no one can say, kurios Jesus. Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So they depended on the Holy Spirit to help them. And that's what Jesus had told them. When, you're, when you go in front of these people, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. And, and that's what Jesus had said in the Gospels. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, <clears throat> Paul said, For what we preach is not ourselves, but what? Jesus Christ as what? Kurios. And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Now we've read about some men or learned about some, some people who have, who have went down. They went down standing up. They went down. They died. They were burned to death or they were killed in some way because they would not say Caesar is Lord. One of those men was a man by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp was uh, an uneducated man, mostly. He, he just loved his people. He just loved the Lord. He just loved the Lord, and he loved his people, and he just led them in that way. And probably that's all you need. That's probably all a leader needs. A good leader needs to love the Lord, and he needs to love the people who are following. And that was Polycarp, and Polycarp went down standing up. He, they burned him at the stake as an old man, 86 years old. We've talked about a guy by the name of Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was an apologist. In other words, he, he took it upon himself in the second century to write to Rome and tell the Romans, hey, you shouldn't be persecuting us. We're not bad people. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean you should persecute us. And, and so he defended the Christian faith and the rationality of the Christian faith to the Roman people. Uh, and to the Roman emperor, he said, we're not cannibals. We're not immoral. He said, we're not social dissidents. We're good people. If we're bad, punish us. But if we're just being Christians, leave us alone. Justin Martyr <clears throat> became a martyr because he went down standing up. And then there was a man by the name of Irenaeus. Irenaeus was a theologian. By this time now, there were some people, because they didn't have a copy of the New Testament, and they couldn't all agree about what, what to teach and what to say, there were people who started teaching other things. So Irenaeus said, no, 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 that's not right. That's not right. Jesus was a real person. And these Gnostics said, no, he couldn't have been real because the flesh is evil. We know it's evil because look at us. And Irenaeus said, no, no, Jesus was a real person. That's what makes us redeemable. That's what makes what he did on the cross salvific. You know this word? Able to save us. That's, what, that's why we can be saved, because he was a man. And he was also, also uh, all God. And so Irenaeus, <clears throat> he, he fought against these people known as the Gnostics. Now this takes us to the third century. In the third century, again, I want to talk about a couple spiritual conditions, things that were going on that I think were, you know, one of these at least kind of led the church astray. And out of this condition, I want to talk, there's two of them, I want to talk about a leader. All right, so the first spiritual condition, I'm going to throw a big word at you here, but I think by now you're ready for it. It's, it's, the, it's this phrase, the monarchical episcopate. I know that you're dying to say that out loud. Would you say it with me? Let's say it. Monarchical episcopate. Now you see the word monarch. The word monarch, you know what that means. That's a king or queen or somebody that's in charge. Monarch. One person. Mono is the word for one. The word arch or arch, that's somebody that's in power. And episcopate, episcopate, you hear the word episcopal, episcopal church. So this word episcopate 
uh, means who's in charge in the church. And this was a one person in charge of the church. This, is, this was the condition of the third century. This is what things had come to. Now, in the early church, the New Testament church, the church after which we're patterned, the role of the church leader or the elder was, was, it was uh, interchanged with another word. There are two words that were used. And it was the word presbyteros, which is the word, you know, you hear the word Presbyterian. Maybe some of you come out of the Presbyterian church. They get their name, their name of their church from this word. That means elder. And they have a system of government that's, uh, there's a presbytery. There's a group of men and women who sit on this leadership board who make the decisions for their church. The presbytery. And there was another word known, uh, uh, translated bishop, which is the word episkopos. Of course, you hear the word episcopate there, and you hear the word episcopalian. So the episcopalians kind of get their, the name of their church from this Greek word that's in the Bible. In the New Testament, both of these words are used to describe one set of men, one, one group of men known as the elders of the church. The words are used interchangeably. So there's two words, but they're used to describe the same person, not two different people. In the third century, they were used to describe two different people. Let's look at uh, Titus chapter 1, and I can show you this. In Titus 1, Paul is talking to this young church leader, this young preacher, and he said, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint presbyteros, that's the form of that word, presbyteros, or elders in every church, in every town rather, as I directed you. A presbyteros... An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife. Now we could stop right there and say, wait, 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 wait a minute. The Roman Catholic Church, they believe their, their leaders have to be what? Celibate. You heard the old joke about the, the priest who's down reading uh, old manuscripts and he says, oh man. And uh, they say, what, what's wrong? What's, he said, the word is not celibate, it's celebrate. <laughs> All these years. Okay, some of you got that, some of you didn't. What about that? We're not going to talk about that. We don't have time. He, said, he says, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient, since a presbyteros, no, that's not what he says here. He's still talking to the same, about the same people, but he uses a different word. Since an overseer, episcopos, Manages uh, God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest game. So you see there, this is the same group of men he's describing and talking to, but two different words used. So in the third century, what happened was that <clears throat> there came to be offices of the church. There, there were elders, presbyteros, but then there were also bishops. And these bishops became men, one man, not a group of men. Here at Gateway, we practice, like they do in the New Testament, the plurality, or the more than one, of the elders. There always has to be more than one elder governing the church. But in the third century, there was one man who became a bishop, and he ruled over all the other churches and all the other elders. So the larger churches, the, the guy who was elevated to bishop, he would tell the elders and all the outlying churches, the smaller churches, or maybe the city church bishop would tell all the people in the country around his city, hey, this is what we're going to do. Here's what we believe. Here's what we teach. So he became the bishop. You can see how in, a, in a, another 100 or 200 years, the, the seat of power in the church became co-located with the seat of power in the empire, which was where? In Rome. So the bishop of Rome became known as the Papa, or the Holy Father, or the Pope. So you see how this happened? Now we can understand how it happened. It might have been a question of quantity. Maybe local churches didn't have enough men to step forward and serve as leaders. Maybe there weren't enough qualified men. And I just, as a sidebar here, let me tell you the men of this church. Somebody has to step forward. Somebody has to step forward. Somebody in this church 
has to step forward and say, I'll, I'll, I'll step forward and I'll toe the line. I'll lead. I'll, I'll, if you want me, if you think I'm qualified, if you'll, if you'll help me, I'll be one of those men who lead the church. And uh, I just want to tell you, we, you know, we're, we're getting thin on elders. And we, we, we need more men, spiritually minded, lovers of God, lovers of prayer, lovers of people, who will step up and say, I will, I'll, I'll put myself out there if, if you'll have me. And so uh, maybe it was quantity, maybe it was quality, maybe they had men but they weren't qualified, maybe it was expediency, maybe because there was pressure on the church during this in, uh, intense persecution, and, and maybe tonight we're going to meet at, uh, at Tim's house, but the Romans we, we hear got word that we're going to meet there, and they're going to come and bust us up or take us to prison, so we need to make a quick decision that no, we're going to meet at Dave's house, uh, we're going to trick the Romans. So... Um, uh, you know, it might have been expedient for one man to make that decision versus having a committee meeting. So we can understand how it happened, but it still it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right that there's one man in a place who says what is so for all the church all over the world. Now, we're not Catholic. We don't recognize the Pope as having any spiritual authority over us or over our church. To us... The, the bishop of Rome is not only illegitimate, I mean, he's, he's not legitimately the leader of the whole church, but he may be, he may be working against the cause of Christianity. There's a lot of pressure on that guy to affirm, say, Islam and other religions just for the sake of peace. And there's a lot of pressure on him to affirm anything and everybody just to keep everybody happy. And as church leaders, you cannot keep everybody happy. There's only one person you need to keep happy. And hopefully the other people who are trying to keep that one person happy will be happy. Who's that one person? The wife? <laughs> Not the wife. Who is it? Jesus. Jesus. And hopefully the wife will be happy if you're trying to keep Jesus happy. So the monarchical episcopate, this one bishop rule, it was a one bishop rule, was something that happened. Now here's, here's a result of, of this. There's this man named Origen who was a brilliant mind. He was way ahead of his time. He was a theologian. He, he wrote something on every book of the Bible. He preached sermons. He was just way ahead of his time. Now, he didn't have a copy of the Bible. He had some of these letters. So there are a lot of things he taught that you and I wouldn't agree with today. But here's what happened to Origen. Origen, who was, again, he, he, had a, he had a mind that was just incredible. He was far ahead of his time. He had all these writings and all these sermons and all, all this preaching. But he did something and taught something that the bishop didn't like. Now, you can talk to your friends who are in these churches that have bishops, and you can ask them, hey, what if you say something or do something the bishop doesn't like? And you see what they say. And I guarantee you they'll say, well, you've got to get in line with the bishop. You've got to get in line with the bishop because the bishop's in charge. And so because Origen persisted in teaching things that the bishop didn't like, he wouldn't stop. He's like, no, this is what I believe, and this is what I must teach. You know what the bishop said? All right then, you are now considered a heretic. And if a guy was considered a heretic, and this day it wasn't as big a deal, but later, as you've seen on TV shows, if you're a heretic, not only would the Romans kill you, but the Roman Catholic Church would kill you. They would burn you at the stake. They became... The Roman Catholic Church became just like the Roman Empire was in the first three centuries. It's a fascinating study. Now the Roman Catholic Church was killing people. They, if you were a heretic, all because you didn't teach what the bishop said to teach. This is what it turned into. Now, <clears throat> we understand today that there's a lot of things or some things that we need to agree about. But there's a lot of things we don't have to agree about. And just because you don't agree with Pastor Dave on your theology doesn't mean we're going to have you uh, tied up and thrown in jail or something. 
I mean, you might have me tied up and thrown in jail. But we don't do that today, do we? We don't do that today, but that's what was going on in the early ages of the church. Origen was so serious about his, his faith that when he was 15 years old, his dad was arrested by the Romans and taken to prison, and he tried to go. He said, I'm going to go with dad, and, and his dad was eventually killed for his faith, and, and he would have, but his mother hid his clothes. And history tells us that uh, Origen wouldn't go out of the house naked. So his mom hid his clothes so he wouldn't go. He was so serious about his faith that history tells us that he possibly went to a doctor and had surgical castration done so that he wouldn't have to deal with the temptations of the flesh. Now, we don't know if that's so, but that's a story that goes on about him. This guy was serious. He eventually died for his faith outside of communion with the church. In later centuries, they, they continue to call him a heretic. The second and last condition I want to talk about besides the way the church began to be led, was is, is, spir- is a martyrdom as a spiritual pursuit. Martyrdom, of course, is when you die for your faith. Well, by the third century, this became a pursuit. People were like, okay, where can I die? You know, where, where can I make the most trouble and go up and die? And this is why so many people were killed. Now, the word martyr comes from the Greek word marturas, which means witness. And that's what Jesus had said, be a faithful witness. Just be a witness, and whatever happens to you, let happen to you. And and by the way, Christians weren't the first to die for their faith. Jewish people died for their faith before Jesus even came onto the scene. Lots of people in different religions through the ages have died because they would not recant their faith. But this was also common in Christianity. There was a sense that if you died for your faith, it was a sure ticket to heaven. You know, Muslims believe that if you not only die for your faith, but if you die killing unbelievers or infidels, that you'll be rewarded richly in the afterlife. Christians had this view, this was starting in the third century, that hey, somehow you've got to be hard on yourself, that you need to either die or you need to, you need to punish yourself. Maybe you've seen movies where these, uh, where these Catholic men beat themselves. They, you know, they take whips and beat themselves. This grew out of this, this, uh, this idea here in the, in the third century. You know, they had the example of Jesus who himself gave up his life. Paul himself wrote, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. This is an interesting passage. He said, I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord, I face death. Because I'm talking about you being a great church. He said, but if I fight or fought wild beasts in Ephesus, and this is an indication that Christians in his day were being thrown to the wild beasts in the arena. Remember, the Greeks loved sport. They loved athletics. But the Romans made athletics an entertainment sport. They made it an entertainment sport, and we kind of inherited that from them, our culture. So the, Ro- the Greeks just played the games. They didn't care about people watching. They just played the games. But the Romans took the Greeks' love for games, and they turned it into a huge spectator sport. And one of the best things they did, they thought, was to throw Christians to the lions. Let's dip them in blood. Let's make them smell fresh and, and, uh, and you know, tasty. And then we'll throw them out there and see how long they last. And we better have a whole bunch of them because they're not going to last long. Paul said, if I fight, fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? In other words, I can only go to my death in the arena with the wild beasts if I believe that there's something coming after that, if I'm, I'm going to get a reward. So there were people who were pursuing this. This must be a good thing. I'm going to try to give my life for Christ. I quoted Tertullian a week or two ago. He said, he lived in this time, he said, the, the blood of martyrs is the seed of of the church. In other words, it's not hurting us, it's helping us grow. He wrote a book or a a writing called Ad Marturas, which means against or about, about martyrdom, in which he said that some Christians et ultra apatita, they eagerly desired martyrdom. They wanted to die 
One such famous church leader was a guy by the name of Cyprian of Carthage. Cyprian was a black man. He was from Africa, northern Africa, Carthage, where the church really grew and took hold in those early years. On September 14, 258, this is the middle of the third century, he stood on trial in front of, in, in front of the emperor Valerian, who was sitting there watching, and, and he was ordered to sacrifice to the Roman gods, just say, Curios Kaiser, or do something to acknowledge that and it's not just Jesus, but it's our gods as well. And Cyprian refused. The proconsul who was actually doing the, the, uh, the actual trial, Galerius, said this to him. <clears throat> he said, Cyprian, you have long lived an irreligious life. And the Romans thought they were irreligious because they didn't worship all these gods. You have one god, you're atheist. And you have drawn together a number of men bound by an unlawful association. Christianity. And you professed yourself an open enemy to the gods and the religion of Rome. And the pious, most sacred, and august emperors of Rome have endeavored in vain to bring you back to conformity with their religious observances. In other words, we've given you opportunity. We've tried. Whereas, therefore, you have been apprehended as principal and ringleader in these infamous crimes, you shall be made an example to those whom you have wickedly associated with, who have wickedly associated with you. The, the authority of law shall be ratified in your blood. Galerius then made the sentence written from a tablet that said, it is the sentence of this court that Thatius Cyprianus be executed with the sword, to which Cyprian simply replied, Thanks be to God who is pleased to set me free from the chains of this body. Wow. It's incredible, isn't it? Incredible. <clears throat> the lives and deaths of the martyrs, both men and women, are a source of inspiration and emulation even to many later Christians. And Christians would die not just at the hands of the Romans, but as I said, at the hands of other Christians for the next 1,500 years. They would die at the hands of other Christians because they didn't agree, because they couldn't agree. And most of them who died did so willingly. They did so willingly. I wonder if you had the opportunity. Now, I'm not saying seek it out. I'm not saying look for it at all. But if it came right down to it, I wonder what you would decide. Jesus said, whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. He said, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Verses like this last one, led to something that was created or spawned by uh, martyrdom. You know, the early, later church leaders had, they had identified martyrdom in three categories. There was a red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue martyrdom. A red martyrdom was when someone died a violent death after being tortured. They were known as red martyrs. And white martyrdom was when somebody, they didn't die a violent death, and this would happen later after Christianity became legal, but it started happening early in the third century, when people would just go out into the desert. They were known as desert fathers. And they would treat their bodies so hard, they would deny themselves food for days and weeks and months. And, and uh, they would, they would uh, uh, just isolate themselves. For years, for years, and then eventually they die because of the elements, they didn't have a shelter. They gave up the basic necessities of life. If they died that way, they were called white martyrs. It was white martyrdom. If it was just a normal guy who just lived a life of prayer and self-denial and trying to follow Jesus, but he lived with his family and lived with the public, and he died because, uh, you know, he just died an old man, but he'd lived a life, that they were called blue martyrs. That was blue martyrdom. There was one such guy named Anthony the Great. Anthony was a, a, a white martyr. He, was a, he suffered white martyrdom. And those dates are correct. He lived to be 104 years old. At the age of 20, his parents died, left him with a little sister and a whole lot of money. He gave all his money away. He 
put his sister uh, with some other Christian friends, and he went out to the desert. He lived in the desert for another 86 years. Now, he, he had different things happen to him, and for a little while there were some people who came around him and said, hey, teach us how to live like this. And, but, but when he died, he died in isolation at the age of 104. And this became known as monasticism. And eventually women started doing this. And they would deny themselves fleshly pleasures and give themselves completely to God and to the church. And it all started here in the third century. Was this right? Is this the right way to live? Do you think we should leave the world and go out and live as hermits or monks or nuns? There are a lot of people who still do that today. They do that today. Is this what Jesus meant when he said you are in the world, but you're not of the world? I don't think so. I don't think Jesus wants you to pull out and separate yourself from culture. He doesn't want you to live like the culture. He doesn't want you to act like the culture. But he wants you to be there so the culture knows who he is and what it looks like to know him. So the big question for us as we close today is, because of my faith in Christ, how is my life different? How is it different? How will I stand out to those around me? That's the question I want to leave you with. Lord God, thank you so much for your love and grace. Thank you for these stories of uh, inspiration, these stories of courage under, under the threat of death and torture. I thank you, God, that uh, you, you raised up men and women to stand on the line, to toe the line of faith, and not throw in the towel, not give it up. Lord, there are so many of us today who throw in the towel when, when something minor happens in our life, when things just don't go our way. But these people are being threatened with life and limb, and yet they stood up for Jesus. Lord, may that be our uh, desire. May that be our pursuit to stand up for him, come what may. Make our lives different, God, because of him, because of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. As you stand and sing this song, if you have a, a public decision you'd like to make today, or if you need prayer, I invite you to come as we sing.